Okay, so we have a full program, so if everyone could take their seats, we will go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm Henry Jenkins. It's my pleasure to invite you, to welcome you to tonight's Geek Speaks event. Geek Speaks is a program run once a semester by the Annenberg Innovation Lab. Uh, and I've jokingly referred to it as geek bait because we want people <laughs> to know that the lab has many great opportunities for students uh, to work on projects. It's now opening a, a maker space here on campus. Uh, we're always looking for students who want to be part of various collaborative teams and projects. And we encourage you to seek out information uh, at the Innovation Lab, which is in the west wing of the Annenberg Annenberg Building. Uh, and much of this is kind of through their generous sponsorship. But tonight we're also sponsored by uh, the Visual Studies uh, Research Group here at USC, by the, uh, game, uh, the Game Design Division of the Cinema School, and by the Animation Division of the Cinema School, all of whom have a collective interest in tonight's program. Uh, in the spring, we're going to be hosting uh, an event focused on cyberpunk that will be jointly run with the Visions and Voices program, and we're excited. It's all tentative, but it's, it looks like we will have William Gibson, Bruce Sterling, Rudy Rutger, and Pat Cadigan together for that event, as well as a number of other folks from this town and elsewhere who were deeply influenced by the cyberpunk movement. So that will be an all-day event. Uh, we hope you guys will check it out and uh, sign up for, for it in the spring. And it will combine screenings and some workshops, uh, storytelling workshops, world building workshops with some of the authors who are coming through. So tonight I'm joined by Scott McLeod, um, who we were just walking through it, but it sounds like 95, 96 he came to MIT for the first time. I was a junior faculty member. Uh, he had just published Understanding Comics, and this is, I think, the fifth event we've done together since, <laughs> yeah. since that time. Exactly. Um, so, and that doesn't include all the times that we get together as couples at uh, San Diego Comic-Con. <laughs> uh, so I'm lucky to have had several decades of time with Scott McCloud and consider him one of the best thinkers about comics as a medium and someone who's incredibly generous and provocative uh, in equal measure. So tonight, the goal is to revisit um, McLeod's book, Reinventing Comics, uh, which you published, uh, was it 2000? Yeah, I think so, yeah. And uh, the sort of walk, sort of pay attention to some of the, the arguments about what would happen to comics over the book was saying the next 20 years. We're getting pretty close to that at this point, so we should be able to figure out which <laughs> of these things happen, which didn't, why, what we didn't anticipate in 2000 about where comics are today. And the second half of the program will be a number of contemporary comics industry and creative talent who will discuss from their vantage point and respond to some of the things that Scott and I are talking about. And Jeff Long will be moderating that second half. And we'll have a relatively brief break in between. So why don't you set up the writing of the book a little bit, Scott? What, what was happening in 2000? What's the context this book came out of? Um, sure. Um, first of all, is my mic? Yeah, I'm on, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, the background, the funny thing is when I got around to it in 2000, it was already, it was almost old news, all of the, the stuff I was writing. Now, the, the book comes in two parts. The first half is, is about the di different revolutions that that comics uh, aspire to, you know, uh, uh, literary aspirations, artistic aspirations, um, uh, diversity, uh, public acceptance, all these different things. And then the second half of the book was all about comics and computers, um, especially uh, digital produ production, digital distribution, and digital comics at a time when we were still, you know, uh, logging on uh, using 14.4 modems and that sort of thing. And, and comics on the internet usually meant, you know, tiny little black and white comic strips that would load extremely slowly. Um, but nevertheless, I had been thinking about it ridiculously long time at that point. 2000, the ideas were beginning to get stale in my mind because I, from, from 94, really my book came out in 93 originally, Understanding Comics, but I was already obsessed with digital comics. I was obsessed with the possibilities of digital spaces, uh, even with things like CD-ROMs. Voyager had approached me to do a CD-ROM of understanding comics, and I didn't want to just adapt it. 
the way that all their other stuff had been done. I wanted to do something a little bit more radical and try to rethink how comics worked. And when I spoke at MIT in 96, I believe it was, I was already talking about infinite canvases and uh, you know, using some of the, the same ideas of like preprint comics and trying to appropriate unbroken reading lines from the bio tapestry and crazy stuff like that. That stuff all goes back uh, to the pretty much the very beginning. So 2000, I was like, God, now I have to put it into print. And it was just frustrating that, that um, I hadn't kind of gotten it across by then. But it felt late to me in 2000. Um, so that was the kind of, that was the setup basically is these are Scott's old ideas finally making it into a book. <laughs> you know, I, ironically in 2000. Um, uh, it was all I could think about in those days. I was obsessed with the possibilities for, um, for especially for the di distribution of comics, for reinventing the commerce of comics, uh, and for reinventing the shape of comics online. That was, it was all I could talk about. I mean, to an almost insane degree. Um, uh, I, Jeff Smith tells stories of me at three in the morning in Oakland, like talking his ear off about this stuff. It was, it was bad. I was, <laughs> I was unable to have ordinary conversations in those days. So I had to get it off my chest. In other words, that's sort of the background. So I, I was in looking, getting ready for this, I looked up some of the responses in Comic Journal when the book came out, <laughs> which was not exactly your fan club at the no, time. No, no, never has been. You know, Gary, Gary Groth was sort of, you had argued that the rise of digital would result in diversification, uh, more opportunities, more fragmentation of who's producing comics yeah. in a way. And Gary Groth was taking the curmudgeonly other perspective, which was that we would, DC and Marvel would control more of comics than ever before, mm -hmm. that this would lead to greater concentration. So I think it's interesting to look at those two sides now. How would, how would you think, how do you think we've ended up? Well, I, you know, his, his position was the same as John McChesney, who at that point was talking about how we were all going to be uh, America Online's bitches, and you know they would, you know, essentially that the 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 entrenched interests would be able to leverage, uh, you know, that 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 power and, and influence via enough piles of cash that they would pretty much just take it all over. And this idea of the open internet was just a myth, a te temporary myth that would be overrun by the same old corporate masters. Um, that looked to be a non-star. I mean, that, that, that point of view looked increasingly ridiculous for, for a while. I think in more recent years, with the return of the walled garden and mobile devices and, and uh, more, uh, you know, more control from single vendors and that sort of thing, um, I think that Gary Groth's side of the argument starts to get a little bit more weight. And we do have some sinister signs that, that the, the web that we love so much and the open architecture of the web could be co-opted, uh, you know, and as we see things like net neutrality under attack. Um, so I don't feel like I can do any victory laps as far as that goes. However, on, on terms of diversity, in terms of the nature of the open web itself, diversity did become um, a diversity of content. Uh, there's a few different types of diversity, isn't there? Um, diversity of content did, in fact, become uh, the the, um, the the word of the day, and uh, I, there there. There's what I think of as front door diversification and, back, and, and side door diversification. Front door diversification was, hey, I make comics for comic book shops, and I want to make comics about golfing, okay? And I think that, I think that uh, golf, there are so many golfers in America, they would love to have a comic. So you put a golfing comic next to, you know, the, the Incredible Hulk and, and um, uh, you know, G-Man or whatever, and you need someone to come through the front door of the store in order to buy it. So they have to already be into comics and be a golfer. <laughs> Side door diversification is uh, what we had on the web, though, and that is, wow, there's a comic about golfing. I'm just going to click and go there. Um, and that's what happened with things like Penny Arcade, where, where suddenly you had a, any subject at all could have a comic about it, and anyone who was interested in that subject could come in through the side door, come in through the portal of their own interests and discover that thing. And that's how suddenly we could have, you know, a, 
you know, a strange little peculiar nerdy stick figure comic about math with a, a million readers a day that I'm sure you could all name, uh, or, or the Penny Arcade Empire, or any number of other comics about many, many, many other different subjects um, could just proliferate. You know, we've had this tremendous balkanization of categories. I mean, you know, we, we remember, you know, blockbuster video and, and music stores and how, you know, well, is it R&B or is it rock? <laughs> You're done. That's, these are the only two <laughs> categories of music. As soon as, as soon as uh, you know, uh, content hits the web, it just shatters into a million tiny, unique snowflakes of, of genre. So the diversification thing, that happened. But that happened because of the open architecture of the web. And we could argue that at the same time, uh, mass media, side, DC and Marvel, are more powerful than ever, ever before, leaving the concentration of the web aside. Yeah, well, actually, Marvel and DC, as a as a market share of all comics produced and read in America, uh, are not as powerful as they used to be. They do still have uh, a very strong market presence, um, but the graphic novel movement, which which does not favor that sort of content, is is doing pretty well. I mean, you know, uh, books like Persepolis or or Mouse uh, or um, you know the work of Chris Ware or or Alison Bechtel. Um, really does have a real presence. Uh, you know, I've spoken in a lot of universities and I've done a lot of class visits and you'd be amazed how many different types of classes assign Persepolis. I mean, there have been whole cities have made that their book, you know, like a one book, one city, those programs. Um, that thing has real penetration far more than any issue of the X-Men, you know, ever has. Um, and, you know, the, the numbers, there have been recent stats, you know, of like, I mean, compared to when I got into it, I mean, graphic novels have a much bigger market share. But yes, there are still a lot of floppies with superheroes and guys in tights in them. Absolutely, they're still out there and still a big part of it. And I guess the third part of the picture today is that I gather Kickstarter is now the third largest publisher of comics <laughs> in the United States. Yeah. And that called crowdsourcing of comics funding was not a model that either of you necessarily anticipated at the time. No, no. In fact, uh, you know, a web entrepreneur named Joey Manley memorably said that begging is not a business model. Um, and, uh, you know, I understood where he was coming from, and I was not so much interested in the donation tip jar uh, sort of model as it originally was constituted. Uh, but Kickstarter and Patreon uh, more recently, I think, are interesting as in the way that they're... I, for me, they're, uh, they are amplifying the one thing that I think I got right early on in terms of commerce, which was the, the sort of like an awareness of how much, pow how much more power the consumer has when their dollar has, doesn't have to go through that, that battery of a, a, an army of middlemen. You know, when somebody, if, if you buy one of my books in the store, uh, it might cost you $20. They're kind of expensive, actually. Um, I'm never going to see uh, that money, uh, I'll see maybe two dollars worth. Now, theoretically, if you're if that thing is being transmitted digitally and you were paying twenty dollars, which you shouldn't, but if you were, uh, I would be seeing a much much bigger chunk of that. Now, of course, the, those middlemen are leveraging more and more power now because of the walled garden. But um, but the, then the question comes: Okay, well, if that's the case, if the consumer can. Um, if their dollar has more power, then you have the prospect through Kickstarter or through Patreon that they might be able to, uh, to drop that dollar into your pocket in a way that's going to have a lot more impact. And so somebody can just choose, somebody can just spend a few dollars a month and change the lives of people through, let's say, pay, you all know Patreon? This is a more recent one than kids. Everybody knows Kickstarter, right? Yeah, you guys all know Kickstarter. How many people know Patreon? Show of hands. Okay, so that's, that's about a third of you. Patreon is just sort of, it's like Kickstarter, but for continuing work. And this may be especially relevant to comics artists because it's a way for somebody to say, you know what, I'm going to give you a dollar a month. You're just, you're putting this stuff out there all the time. You're making your comics, and I'm just going to pledge a dollar a month. If you start screwing up or you start not updating, maybe I'll take away the dollar a month. Zach Wienersmith, who does Saturday morning breakfast cereal, is now making eighty, ninety thousand dollars a year, I think, on this. Now there aren't a lot of success stories like that, but 
they're getting, there's some spreading out of that. But for me, that's a reminder of the power of the consumer whose dollar is no longer reduced to a tenth. It's literally decimated. I mean, that's, that's at best, it's decimated in the physical market, whereas they have the potential through these systems of uh, allowing that dollar to arrive at, let's say, 80% of its power. That's, that's an extraordinarily different market that you have. And so, so, so all of a sudden, donations mean something. They have power. That's something I want to do through commerce, but that's a whole other thing, yeah. The well, well, under the category of dude, where is it? Where is my jetpack? Let's <laughs> let's talk about micropayments yeah, for yeah. a moment, because oh, you and God, I were yeah. both major it. advocates of micropayments <laughs> at the time this came yeah. out, and that's obviously something that hasn't come to pass. No, not at all. Any sense on why and what the you know what's taking its place in terms of satisfying the demands you thought it would serve? Yeah, well, there's a, no question what's taking its place, but but just very quickly, micropayments, the idea that there should be some way essentially for the consumer and the producer to exchange small amounts of money transparently and quickly. Uh, the equivalent of, of the consumer just reaching out and putting uh, a dime in my pocket, let's say. Uh, it seemed to me that when you did eliminate that army of middlemen, there should be some way uh, for, for us to sort of meet, meet in the middle. Maybe even for the artist to give more ground and have the price closer to what they were getting before, uh, so that the consumer, instead of instead of ban, buy, is paying a few dollars for a song or even a dollar for a song, I thought it should be around twenty-five cents a song. Because good God, there's no trucks, there's no store, there's no. Why should an album be ten dollars? You know. So so this was the the idea that okay, it should be quick, it should be easy. Um, the only thing that had been holding those back was a function of time of uh, computational resources and bandwidth, and both of those things seem likely to improve over time, as they did. Um, so a few people rushed into that space. There were a couple of guys from Stanford who had a system that I kind of liked called BitPass, not related to Bitcoin, although there's some echoes there um, in recent years. Um, and they had a system that was pretty simple. It looked like it could be sort of the Google for, for these tiny transactions. The reason it went, the reason it crashed, I think, is first of all, it wasn't quite simple enough. I think they did a good job, but there was still a sign up. You're still putting a credit card in at the beginning, just maybe just the first time. But that's an awfully big bar barrier for these very insubstantial, fleeting value propositions. And the value propositions themselves were a little weak. I think you know, um, if you were getting, you know, I, the, the idea of digital goods. Really, songs and movies were the only digital goods that people saw as so solid they were willing to spend money on them. And they didn't want to have to go through a big sign up for it. So we were never, never able, through things like comics, to provide that value proposition to the extent where people were willing to make that initial hurdle. Some did. I mean, they made you know, some money pass through those gates. But the trading of nickels and dimes, it just didn't catch on. The reason we wanted to do that, though, whether it worked or not, the reason we wanted to do it is because if you have a common currency, if there's a currency that everybody trusts, that they, they jump over that hurdle and now the currency is accepted and works, then you can have tens of thousands of vendors, just as you have in the real world. Right now, you can walk out onto the street and find a shop, and you know that shop is going to take those little pieces of paper that you have in your pocket or there's little pieces of plastic. There's a common currency backed by the faith and credit of the United States government. And so you have a multiplicity of vendors. When you do not have a common currency, a web currency like that, uh, then you inevitably get single vendors. You get one or two gigantic vendors. Because then now, I only, I, you know, I'm willing to sign up with iTunes, willing to sign up with Netflix, I'm willing to sign up with Amazon, and I'm done. Right? Enough already. I can get all my stuff through them, and I really don't like filling out these forms. So I'm done. And now it's pretty obvious the world you get when you have these mammoth vendors. You have this tremendous bottleneck. That's the world we have today, because we don't have a common internet currency that people can just spend back and forth with ease and transparency. So I can at least say that the world we have today illuminates 
the problem of not having micros, but we were never able to pull off the actual proposition. So early in the book, you're, you're really making, you're also describing this moment of growing prestige for comics, which you alluded to just yeah. a moment ago. And the hope is that we're going to diversify who creates comics, not just mm -hmm. comics content, which has been a pet cause of yours, but yeah. also more women, more minorities, and yeah. so forth. How do we stand on that? Have we made progress since 2000? or On women, on gender balance, I, I stand by my informal prediction 10 years ago that within 20 years from that point that we'd have a majority female industry, believe it or not. Um, I think we will. I think in, the, with, in about 10 years we're going to have a majority female industry. And that's, be, that's because girls read, number one. Number two, a whole lot of girls read manga back in the day and a, a certain significant minority of those grew up, went to art school and are now making comics. And because there's this all ages revolution that is uh, majority female as well. Um, in art schools all over America, if, you're, if, you, if art students are making comics, the, at least half and often a majority of them are girls. I had a class in uh, Tennessee that was, I think, 72% uh, female. So that's, that's going well. And the reason being that, that uh, whatever the content of the comic, there's going to be some outlet for it online. Uh, yes, Marvel and DC are as hidebound and, and, and limited as they ever have been, but the demand is going to be there. It's, it's just going to break through. People like Raina Telgemeier are just creating baby readers. At, at, they're just reader factories. They're just making readers all the time. Minorities, not as good. Um, uh, some progress. In, in a number of different ethnic groups, but still very few African-American uh, creators. I mean, they're out there, uh, but uh, I think it's still kind of a pale movement. If you go to, like, the art comics uh, shows like SPX, Ape, uh, Mocha, uh, where a lot of really interesting stuff is, is going on now, it's still, I don't know. It's still a little pale. And I think that probably has as much to do with economics as anything. I think that, you know, if you're going to make, if you're going to make like mini comics and, you know, uh, you know, weird silk screen comics that are bound with twine and things like this, it's like all these really adventurous, uh, strange comics that you're printing in editions of 100 or 200. I think you need to believe deep down that you live in a country that will never let you starve. And 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 I think that that's I think I think downwardly mobile white guys I think are more likely to to, to believe that something. So I think I think there's an economic uh, aspect to it, but but you know these things can flip quickly. Gender flipped quickly. It was like there was this moment, the, a relatively short moment, where where. Um, you know, it seemed like, oh my God, this is always going to be a boys club. And then it just flipped and it happened quickly because you had a few, you know, really powerful, brilliant or influential uh, female creators like Bechtel, like Satrapi, um, that just sent out this message. And then you have, you have a little, you have a generational pause. You have this moment where, where readers of a certain age see this, respond to this, and then come back in a few years and start creating themselves. And then those, those have that repeater effect. It's a, it's a feedback loop. So, so it, it can seem to take a little while, but then you can wake up one day and realize that you've just crossed the threshold and now you have a much more diverse community in that, in that one respect. So I, I'm hopeful that we're going to see uh, you know, big changes in terms of diversity of ethnic background, but it's, I don't know. I feel like that one we're, we're still we're still kind of behind on it. And again, I think that, that I think economics may, may be one of the factors in that one. Well, critics of digital media have attacked in recent years the idea of the infinite jukebox, the idea that every music will, piece of music will be readily available to us. And in some ways, you ended up with the infinite comic shop, right, where all the yeah. great comics of the world would be readily available to us. And so how I, I'm interested in your thoughts on where we're at in that process. To some degree, 
one can argue that reprints, say, have never, we've never seen as many reprints of classic comic strips. Yeah. And the in market print. and print, for sure. And, this, and the classic, the stuff that Sunday Press is doing uh, has got to be the heaviest accumulation of atoms ever to play on Negroponte's distinction between atoms and bits. Yeah. But it's the sort of stuff that, that it has a diffused readership that in an age of print comic shops would have had trouble finding a market, I think, and does build off of the ability of people to order it over online and reach a variety of different scattered constituencies. Well, I do, I, I have to admit, I know it's probably not very fashionable, but I actually still believe in the infinite jukebox. I, you know, I, I've seen no evidence that that's not where we're headed. I think that the basic DNA of the web as it's constituted is absolute access to absolutely everything. And then I don't see us like shying away from that, that sort of general trend. Yeah, there are, there are things that hold it back. Um, and there are, there are ways in which maybe we're, we're moving a little retrograde in, in some forms of commerce and uh, some degrees in which, in which some things are being restrained and all. But I just, I don't know, I just, I can't see how we're not heading in that direction, certainly compared to when we were growing up. Oh, for sure. Yeah, when we started out, I mean, you know, yeah, there are a lot of books, but probably only 10% of the intellectual material that should have been available to us was, was in print at all. Books would come out, and if they didn't do well in the first, you know, few months, they would just vanish, never come back. Books that, that people, in some cases, were passionately attached to, that they loved, those books were unavailable at any price. You know, never mind file sharing. I mean, you know, the, the, for sale or for free or whatever, it, they just simply didn't exist, except, you know, uh, in, 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 you know, decaying, uh, you know, uh, uh, bookshops. A decaying bookshop. That sounds terrible. I mean, like, like you know, a few used bookshops. Um, yeah. Decaying bookshops. I'm sorry. Oh. Oh, 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 I didn't tell you. Oh, my God. Yes, I'm jet lagged. So um, <laughs> I just came back from the UK. That's, we were keeping our fingers crossed that my plane wouldn't be delayed. So this could, I could be much loopier than usual, which uh, could make for good theater. So, yeah, this is a bit of a high, high wire act as to whether Scott will just, just wig out all of a sudden. Um, so yeah, that's chalk that up to sleep deprivation. But um, I just believe that that's sort of the DNA of, of the web, of the internet generally. I mean, Ted Nelson may have been a little odd in, in some ways, but uh, it seemed to me that that essential idea was, it's there, it's still happening. Well, I, I, in doing my research, I stumbled on the statement on your website. Today, most web comics are short gag strips and most long-form comics are page-to-page -page formats that look a lot like their paper counterparts. The early tribe of mad scientists I belong to were a fringe movement, and in some ways we always were. But with the advent of multi-touch displays, increased bandwidth, and increasingly efficient JavaScript engines on the way, we may yet see these issues resurface in the coming years. So let's start with the downside of that. What, you know, we are not... We are seeing many, many more web comic strips that look like print comic strips than we're seeing yeah. the infamous canvas that you were advocating for. Sure. Well, actually, you know, the funny thing is that um, the the infinite canvas, this idea that um, that there's no reason to break up comics narratives at all, that they can all just be laid out on a single canvas, um, that actually never had anything to do with comic strips. This is a funny little secret. Is I, I always found myself in, in tussles with different comic strip artists who felt like I wasn't plugging their work, to be quite honest. That's usually what it was about. Um, when I was going on about all these experimental comics, I wasn't talking about them. I never really was. I mean, the, the strips are fine. Three, four panel comic strips on the web, they work fine. They work well in a web page. They work well surrounded by banner ads and ads for t-shirts and and mugs and things, there's no downside to that because, because you start reading them and you're done. The, the idea of trying to maintain any kind of sustained narrative spell of, of pulling you in and eliminating distractions and creating a seamless narrative experience, it really doesn't matter if the whole thing's only going to take you 20 seconds to read. So, so they, they worked. They showed up on web pages. They were a natural, they made people laugh, and if you made enough people laugh, you could find ways to uh, monetize, I hate that word, but to monetize, you know, that laughter. 
Okay, so that's fine. So that's this separate thing. Strips. Strips did well. A lot of strips on the web, and some people are actually making a living from them. But then there's the long stuff. There's stuff like what I was interested in doing, graphic novels, things that lasted for 50 or 100 or 600 or 800 pages. How was that going to survive on the web? And it saddened me a little that, that people were still breaking them in, especially breaking them into upright rectangular pages. I mean, good God. It's like the screen looks like this. We have two eyes next to each other. This is the this to me is the aspect ratio of life itself. This is why movies, <laughs> plays, uh, everything has that aspect ratio. Somehow we got it in our in our heads that this was the shape of print because the printed page is that shape. It's that upright rectangle. This, but but even that's not even the shape of print because this is the shape of print, <laughs> right? The open book fills our eyes. We want, we want that sustained lengthy media, like a novel, like a TV show, like a movie, like, like a graphic novel. We want that to fill our field of vision because we want to eliminate those distractions such that we can forget about the method by which that story is coming to us and lose ourselves in that story. That was the central proposition of most storytellers. They want you to be, to, to lose yourself in that story. And and if you're scrolling and hunting and pecking and you know, trying to mouse your way around it, or if you're being distracted by constant you know, clicks to go to new pages with banner ads coming up and you know, all that stuff, that's, you're being yanked out of it. Basically, as a, as, as a general proposition, it seemed to me that no matter how you organize your comic online, if you're going to do a long comic, the proposition is the reader should not have to take their eyes off the content. Simple as that. And, there, and the navigation should be single mode navigation. So let's say you've made your page the shape of the screen. Reasonable, right? Fits right on the screen. Let's say that the whole page is a next button. So in other words, when you're done reading that page, you click anywhere, anywhere at all on the page uh, to go to the next page. That to me works, because, and I've seen a number of comics do that. That's fine, it works because now you're just reading the comic. And when it's time to go to the next page, you're not even thinking about it. You're just hitting a button. Likewise, if you're hitting the right arrow key and it just goes to the next page. Likewise, if you're hitting a down arrow key or, you're, or you know, a, a, you know, one of the little two-finger scrolly things on your mouse and, and it's just going down in a long row, same thing. Those are the same proposition to me because they're both single mode navigation. You're not thinking about the mode of navigation and you're not taking your eyes off the content. And so you're able to lose yourself within that content. Uh, that, that to me seems like just good usability. But to see so many people still have, McLuhan talked about this. He said that the, that the, the shape of the previous uh, technology would become the content of the new technology. And every time I see that, that upright rectangle on this you know, portrait on a landscape screen, uh, I just, I want to hurt something. <laughs> it angers me. It's because it's 2014. That makes me genuinely sad. But it's a usability thing. It's the, it's the usability side of me, not the mad scientist at all. It's actually the reader who's angry. Not the one who wants to see this crazy multi-directional, click anywhere, go in multi-branching paths thing. I like that stuff. I like my friend Daniel Merlin Goodbury who does a lot of those things. Great stuff. But that was never the point. The point was actually just putting comics back together in a way that you always knew where to read next. You always could just follow that reading line, whether it was a simple scroller or whether it was a crazy quilt of branching. Either way, it was the simplicity, the natural, the intuitive quality of those interfaces. That's what excited me about it. So it's weird. It's like somehow, somehow I became a champion of weird ex explorations and, 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 and experimentation. But in, in, on the rear guard on, and at the caboose of this whole process, I became the crabby old man who just wanted it to be readable, you know? <laughs> and I still just want it to be readable because the fate of comics online, the long form stuff, the stuff I like to do, um, really hinges on its being readable. 
Well, the, the optimistic side of the statement I read was all about these new technologies coming out now. So yeah. can you say a little more about how you think they will change things? Well, uh, you know, we, we really needed, you know, things like HTML5 to me seem promising uh, because in my extremely uh, poorly understood, you know, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not a programmer, obviously. Uh, but I could see, I could see the or, or the sort of things that the Chrome team was working on with their JavaScript engine when I was doing the comic to explain Chrome. Um, it just seemed to me that they were finally making fast and intuitive the sorts of things that had been very clunky and required plugins like Flash before that. Um, and this was just something as simple as uh, the screen knowing where you are, like where are you in the comic. You know, they, they, previously there was no acknowledgement of where the reader was when you were reading, like these long scrollers. Has anyone seen the Korean comic where the face turns? Has anyone seen this? Yeah, you've seen it. Right. I just, one or two people are like going, oh, oh God. It's like, it's like this Korean horror comic. You're reading along and there's this woman in a deserted parking garage or something like that and she sees this figure in front of her and she's like oh what's going on he's walking really strangely and you see her looking closely and then you see the figure from behind and as the panel comes up into screen the figure turns and with this <laughs> sound and you're like ah and people were people were actually filming their friends <laughs> watching the comic, you know, just to get to when they came to that point, because that's really freaky. The comic knows when I'm reading that panel. Uh, but there are a lot of more subtle things that aren't quite so gimmicky, but they're still, they take advantage of that. Uh, my friend Patrick Farley up in the Bay Area has done a number of these long, really beautiful, sort of crazy, uh, psychedelic diorama comics uh, where where there's there are a lot of triggered actions as you arrive uh, at uh, you know at that particular part of the canvas. It's really helpful to know where the reader is. Um, boy, I really went off the real. I don't know. It's in interesting like, places. <laughs> <laughs> They're just. It's just. You know. You want stability. You want speed. And you want transparency in order to pull off the sort of things that at one point in their development seem like novelties and experimentations, but down the road you realize they're really just the dawning of simple, basic, effective, useful storytelling techniques. Um, I mean, just something as simple as frequency modulation. This one blows my mind that, that we haven't really gone down this road yet. When we started putting comics back together in, in these scrolls, the, the, us, the, 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 the mad scientists, of which I was part of that club, when we started to like say, hey, you know what, let's just have a 300 panel comic, except it's all one long scroll, right? Well, we, w one of the things that we came up with was the fact that throughout the history of comics for 100 years, and I don't even think I mentioned this in Reinventing Comics, we've had We've had changing size and shape of panels, but we almost never changed the space between the panels. I mean, think about how crazy that is. Like throughout a hundred years, the space between the panels is all goes all the way from like four millimeters to maybe twelve millimeters. And that's it. And it'll be consistent throughout the entire comic, throughout an entire company of comics. <laughs> Like, you know, go through Marvel Comics for like 20 years probably had, yep, that's, that's how much space we, we want between the panels. Why? Okay, so well, because we don't want to waste paper. But if you're putting the thing online, there's no reason to worry about wasting paper. So why can't you just do this? You know, if that temporal axis is vertical, if your eye is moving through the thing vertically, then we understand intuitively that when we do this, we're changing the pace of the sequence. You know, if you're going bap, 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 that has a certain staccato rhythm to it. But if it suddenly goes bap, 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 you're changing it. That's frequency modulation. That's like such a basic thing. It's like, it's like we were missing part of the orchestra. Yet, and yet still, we, we cram them together. We cram them together. Because it takes a while. It takes people a while to even realize they can do something. 
the early comic strips, uh, excuse me, the early comic books for seven years were just people taking comic strips and putting them four to a page. It's like, look, now we can put more strips on the page. Done. Right? <laughs> Progress. It's like, and it took people like Will Eisner to come along and say, you know, you have a big piece of paper there. You could do things with that. <laughs> right? But it takes a while. It takes literally years for people to just wake up and see what's right in front of them. Well, you, you, are, you are something of a critic of multimedia uh, running through reinventing Ooh, comics. Yes and no. It's, it's, it, mm. Yeah. I, I, so that seems I, to be yeah. a direction that you were a little anxious about multimedia yes. swallowing comics yeah. and losing the essence of what that medium could look like. Right. There was a, cer there was a certain point at which if, if um, I mean, the first instinct a lot of people had was, oh, my God, now we can add sound and motion. We can add sound and motion and interactivity. And now, instead of just little tiny boxes, we could make them like just big windows. And then the characters could be moving all the time. And then, you know, like they could be animated and they could be moving. And we could have the actors reading the word balloons. And, and then, you know, like they're, they're moving and they're talking and they're, they're like the big, big panel, like it's the size of the screen and it's just so real and wouldn't that be an amazing comic? And I'm like, I don't think that's comics anymore. <laughs> so, so there was like, you know, so that's, that's where we get things like the motion comics, which, which like, are you sure? Have you looked at this? Because I'm pretty sure that's a movie. Uh, you know, it's like it's it's not moving all the time, but it's kind of a movie. Uh, so there's sort of that's the exit ramp problem. But then there's also the ways in which embedded in multimedia at a certain point. It's interesting, you know, like at certain point, it's sort of hard to tell where you go from one to the other. But at a certain point, it becomes in, uh, what I called it. I called it an undigested lump in the stomach of this new beast that we call multimedia. Multimedia itself had this nascent identity as its own form. And, and simply having comics digested inside of it, to me, without, without addressing the fundamental nature of, of comics, uh, to me seemed like uh, maybe not a dead end, but it's sort of like almost beside the point. It was something that, yes, go down that road. Let's discover that. But to me, it wasn't so much the future of comics as more the way in which comics could put a penny in the hat of this new performer on the stage. It was about something else entirely. Um, now, that wasn't to say that I thought that interactivity didn't have a role. But, but to me, in order for it to remain comics, in order for it to, to take advantage of what makes comics so extraordinary, there had to be that spatial component. So, so in other words, if you go down sort of a hyperfiction route where it's just like, you know, choose your next panel, and the old panel goes away, to me, that was like overlooking what's so magnificent about comics, which is, oh, if I'm going to choose my own path, they should be paths, right? You know, we, what we're doing is we're, we're, we're creating these temporal maps. We're, we're saying that as you move through space, you're moving through time. You're creating a map of time, which is unlike nearly any other art form. Because in, in prose and in, in movies and television, uh, in theater, all of these things, it's always now. And the future is just anticipation, and the past is just memory, right? But in comics, this is this one art form in which the past, present, and future is all around you, and you've created a map. You're rising above this existence that we all live in every day, and looking down at this landscape of time. You're transcending that fourth dimension, or you're, in, you're, you're making it concrete in the second dimension. Uh, so, so there were interact there are any number of interactive iterations of that for instance you can have a comic where you can peel away layers and you know like you could have you could have a sequence of like a hundred panels where you could peel away layers to like see what's what like is really underneath the narrative or to go back to a, a previous uh uh, you know, time span, you know, like where's the temporal axis and where's the spatial axis? Where's, this is starting to sound really weird, I'm sorry, but um, sleep deprivation, but you know, like, like, like there's a, there, in one direction, in one, you know, what you're, I have a whiteboard. I have a whiteboard, yeah, okay, all right, uh, okay, all right, just as an example, okay, all right, let's say you have a living room, okay, you have all these people in a living room, right, your chairs and, People standing around, okay? 
This is just like a diorama. What you're saying is that on the, on the X and on the uh, Z axis, right, which is depth, okay, that's the Z axis there, um, that's a spatial axis, right? Let's say you have that same living room a minute later stacked on top of it, and then again, and then again, and then again, it's just that same living room, but you're, you're, every time you go down, you're going another minute, right? So this becomes the temporal axis, right? So it's spatial axes and temporal axes. If you, if you accept that, that, that you have that option of substituting space for time, you can do some really cool things. At the um, uni um, University of Illinois, Ur Urbana-Champaign, where, where the first graphical web browser was born, they had this big thing actually called Canvas, which is this kind of like cylindrical onion skin thing. You goggled in, and, and they had this thing where like, like if you went down a layer, like imagine it's sort of like a globe. If you went down in altitude, you were going back to flashbacks. But, but, it, the, but the temporal flow was like uh, from west to east, things like that. Um, uh, but but there, there are just like so many different iterations of this. But you can imagine that the interactive component of that, tunneling in, opening doors, right? Uh, um, or substituting, moving, moving panels around, all of these things. But th the key was that they always had that spatial component. You're always creating a continuous spatial canvas of one sort or another. You were never allowing space to just flicker out of existence because when you do that, um, you're stepping away. You're stepping into a different, a different species of art, basically. And I was interested in what, happened to, what happens to this species because there's so much gene splicing still to be done. You know? So it, it really just basically it came down to what was interesting. And, and, the, the, and the exit ramps, they just weren't interesting to me. Also, so, motion comics are really annoying. But that's, <laughs> it's a thing. Well, I, all right, like the Watchmen motion comic. I just, I, eh. It's like those Marvel Comics cartoons from 1963. <laughs> I don't know. It just doesn't work. Why are the voice actors reading the word balloons? Why are there still word balloons? <laughs> There's still word balloons, and voice actors are reading the word balloons. It's like, rrr, 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 rrr. it's like, get that thing out of the way. It's, I can hear him. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a thing. Well, another challenge, I think, as we move watching the major uh, publishers move digitally, is a lot of them are taking away juxtaposition at the core, right? You have yeah. one panel, you swat it aside, you get the next panel, but there's no actual juxtaposition of two images together. Well, there are a couple of different approaches. Um, <laughs> this is where it starts getting complicated, because now, all right, already there's a rainforest of different species. There's the kind of um, comicsology uh, guided view thing, which ironically is not entirely unlike the whole infinite canvas thing, ex where, where you're, okay, you're zooming in and I'm gonna you know, bring you to this part of this panel and this part of this panel. It's meant to repurpose, I hate that word, repurpose printed comics. The idea that, oh, okay, we already drew them, God forbid we should create something new, so let's just you know, push a button and have some, some you know, Code monkeys, you know, like uh, do a digital version where you basically walk through the comic. But then, but then I then I just get enraged because it's like, why are you coming to the end of the page? Why can't we just stack them all and just have it be the same form of navigation all the way? But that's a separate thing. Now, what you just mentioned uh, is a thing that doesn't even have a name yet. Some people call them swipe comics. Some people call them turbo comics. I was just in um, uh, the UK <laughs> today. Uh, <laughs> coming back from, from this festival um, that uh, this, uh, a French artist named Boulet was there, and he was involved with a fellow named Yves Bellac, who had done these sort of like slideshow things where you're sort of swiping to go to the next iteration, and sometimes it'll just be a single panel with a character who's like in this position, then in this position, then in this position, but you'll also have multiple panels. Thrillbent does that, Mark Wade's. Uh, group, their comics. I think that those, those tend to work a little bit better. Um, they'll still have multiple panels, but, but they, they sort of, the, the panels will come up and sort of load. They'll, they'll be self-organizing. Uh, there have been other versions where, where panels will rearrange themselves in front of you. 
I worry about those a little bit because I think that they're so confronting you with the mode of presentation that your likelihood of losing yourself in the story is actually reduced. But they're interesting. And you know what? I, you know, if, if something is interesting and fun and people eventually find that to be an effective form of storytelling, you know, who cares how it fits into some rigid McLeodian definition? But I, you know, but my, my feeling is that maintaining the spatial relationships uh, just helps. It just helps to keep the art form simple at its core. Well, one of, one of the predecessors of comics you talk about in reinventing comics is in our ancient Roman columns, where we have this wraparound <laughs> storytelling, which suggests right, yeah. a three-dimensional possibility yeah, yeah. for comics. Oh, no, I was always for three dimensions. I never saw it as, I never saw comics as linked to print. I never saw comics as linked to two dimensions. I never saw comics as linked to staples. And John Byrne actually said, without the staples, it's, you know, he thought it had to be newsprint and stapled. But uh, no, no, it had nothing to do with the form, the format, the material, none of that stuff. And thank God, in understanding comics in 1993, I had that little bit because I didn't mention computers once. But I was ready. You know, it's like my definition was like, dude, <laughs> come on in. You know, as soon as, as soon as digital came in, it was like, this definition is ready for you, computers. Um, that worked really well. Um, but, but yeah, the tra okay, the Trajan's column thing. All right, first of all, you had, okay, you had things like, I, I found certain Egyptian wall paintings, like the Tomb of Men of the Scribe, where the panel borders, so to speak, were horizontal things. This is like, we're talking 3,000 years ago, right? And you had these little rows of figures going about their business, and the reading direction was actually uh, like this. It goes, it goes in a zigzag, okay? So you read across and then up and then across and then over. Trajan's column, ancient Rome, 2,000 years ago or so, uh, went up in a spiral, okay? Like sort of a barbershop pole, right? Bayou Tapestry. I say they're all comics. You feel free to argue with me afterwards. Um, actually read from two directions and met in the middle. It was set up so they could take it around and, and like teach people by saying, oh, check this out. Look, look at this great battle. And then uh, pre-Columbian picture manuscripts were accordion folded. Like so, they would go on for quite a while. This is back about 500 years ago when Cortez began collecting comics. And they would go in this sort of like, <laughs> like sort of ziggy zaggy thing uh, the, all the way from one end to the other. All of these ideas, all of these different forms, they weren't influenced by each other. They didn't know about each other. They were reinventing the wheel, every one of them. But they all had the same thing in common. They were all a single unbroken reading line. That is, as you move through space, you move through time. Bep, 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 and never changed it until it was done. And everything changed when you got to print which you did in about 1450 with these European broadsheets that are totally comics, I swear to God. I mean, like if you really sat down and looked at them, you'd be, oh my God, these have word balloons and everything. Uh, and they, they were like one, two, three, and then bam, suddenly there's a break. And this break happens several times uh, a page and until you get to the end of the page and you have another kind of break. Um, and so, so to me, if we're going to go post-print, why can't we look at the pre-print stuff and see what, how they did it? And it seemed to me that, that they had a good idea. <laughs> they had a good idea in keeping it a continuous, unbroken reading line. Because why not? The only reason we broke it up in print is because that way we could just fold it up, you know, break up space and have these nice, neat little stacks. This became translated in, in like, you know, Gary Groth's takedown of reinventing comics as Scott McCloud thinks that we should all, you know, like make our comics on, on giant stone columns, which would be really hard to read. And he actually had people talking about, I'm like a guy who said how really hard it was to read Trajan's column. Uh, <laughs> I don't, I think a Bob Relief comic on a column would be cool in digital, partially because uh, you, it would move for you, and you wouldn't have to get on a giant staircase and ride a horse, <laughs> like, all around it. But no, I'm not suggesting we start 
so, shipping those through Diamond to comic <laughs> stores. So what would be the implications of this for virtual reality, which would seem to be the next media revolution we're looking right. at? Well, this is where it all began, actually. It's me standing in, in my mom's house in 1988 or something, and I was talking about all these ideas for comics that I had with my friend Larry Martyr on the phone. And I remember him saying, well, you know what? None of this matters because they're just going to invent virtual reality and then comics will just die and that'll be it. And I was like, and I, was, I remember myself on the phone thinking, I know that's not true. I don't know how yet, but I'm going to figure it out. And in a lot of ways, that's all it is. It's just this childish wish to like, can we get an under end run around that? And the end run ultimately is that this scales, right? Because... No matter what the size of the window, here's the panel you're looking at now. And those other panels, maybe the window is such that you can see the other, you know, three or four panels around it. Maybe the window is such that you can see 10 or 12 panels around it. Maybe the window is not a window anymore. Maybe you're just goggled in and you've got a full 360 view. And you can see it just stretching on like a football field. But you can still just look at that panel, have that awareness of the whole, but lose yourself in the moment, moment after moment after moment. And it can take whatever shape you want it to take. It's scaled. Now, does that mean that as soon as VR actually, because it will, it will come in, it'll come thundering in. I really believe that VR is not just some little fad that everybody just gave up on in 2003 or whatever. But when it does come thundering in, uh, this will still be this odd little side art form. I don't think it's going to be the way most people relax after a hard day's work. It's like, let me just sit down in the virtual space and read me some comics. I don't think that's what's going to happen. Uh, I think we'll be enjoying ourselves in other ways. But I think these things will be beautiful. And I think that people will still seek them out because all art forms that are predicated on a simple idea do survive. They may be minority forms, and I think comics will continue to be a minority form compared to the art of the moving image. But, um, but I think that this, this scales. I think this is what I, what I call the durable mutation. In other words, I think it, it has legs. I don't think it has to go away. And part of it is because that incredible, it's crazy as that looks, and that looks pretty damn crazy now that I'm looking at it again, those diagrams. It's just a really, really simple idea. And all art forms that last are predicated on simple ideas. All right, I'm going to turn to the audience for a question in a minute. Let me ask a last one of Scott while you guys are formulating your thoughts. But so if you were sitting down to write reinventing, reinventing comics <laughs> today, uh, what revolutions should we be thinking about now? Maybe oh, ones that weren't on the horizon when you wrote the book in 2000. Well, like I said, you know, like I've become enough of a crabby old man that I just, my love of good design has been superseded by my anger at bad design. <laughs> and, and, and so now I've just, I just, I just want to break things, basically. <laughs> I, 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 I don't understand why anyone should ever have to scroll and hunt and peck and, Ugh, and I don't know, the real, I think that really the real revolution now in the next 10 years is probably has a lot more to do with the ways in which comics will be joining with all art forms to survive in, in the great war between the, the, uh, those who would like to reassert scarcity and those who would like to reassert control over forms and those who would like to perpetuate this, you know, dawning revolution of, of an open architecture that allows for open experimentation. I, I, I know which side of that I would like to be on, but comics is just part of that picture. Because when it comes to distribution and commerce and control over people's artistic ambitions, that's something that all art forms are now joined at the hip in. Um, Comics is just one of many, and uh, I hope that, um, I don't know, I, I, I think that's, that's the real revolution now. And, you know, I, I said that to me, 
digital distribution was about convergence. It was about the ways in which all art forms were, were heading down into the same massive Niagara Falls of, of change. Uh, and digital comics was about divergence. It was about each art form finding its unique qualities and uh, standing, standing on its strengths, on its unique qualities. And see, that's a repeat. That's, that's sleep deprivation. I just said the same thing twice. Um, divergence in terms of being its own art form. I don't want comics to be aspiring to be like a miniature movie. I don't want them to be thought of as just prose plus illustration. I want them to be comics as comics. Um, and that's really about that notion of diversity. This is very theatrical having the curtain done it. I think somebody just hit a button by mistake. <laughs> Hey, That's weird. The curtains are closing for comics. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was awesome. <laughs> yes. That's so weird. Uh, okay, so we have mics here. If people have questions, we're happy to entertain them. Uh, yes, down here. Hey, Scott. Um, I was wondering, uh, we have a very international audience here. We have a lot of students from Asia and Latin America and all. And I was wondering, uh, a lot of the conversation of comics has been very centered in the United States. I was wondering if you could talk about how these uh, issues affect the globalization of comics. You know, like how are Japanese publishers dealing with, uh, you know, things going digital or uh, Latin American, uh, you know, publishers? I can tell you that in Korea, these the vertical scrollers are actually the norm. Uh, most Korean web comics are just they're scrollers, but they're but they're still hedging their bets. You know, often you can still break them up into pages. It's just that that's how they like to do it. Um, uh, I know a lot of my favorite web comics now are uh, like they're scattered around the globe. When, when I do my talks, for instance, I show one from uh, Norway one from France, one from Korea, one from uh, Melbourne, Australia, one from Vancouver. So there's, there's sort of scattering there. Um, uh, Brazil's pretty, pretty high on comics, but I think they're, they're, they have some native talents, but they're also consuming a lot of Western comics right now. Other South American countries, I'm not sure, although I am giving a couple of lectures in Santiago in um, December, so I don't know. Things may be changing down there. Um, Asia, of course, manga still looms large. The Japanese influence, if you look to Chinese and Korean comics, you can still see the fingerprints of, of certain Japanese masters uh, there. But there are a lot of changes happening there. And I think they, the idea of a native comics culture is very important to them. And, and I think they're going to increasingly work towards much more a, a strong native industry. I'm actually speaking at Shanghai International Schools uh, for two weeks uh, in only a couple of weeks. Uh, and I did that back in 2008 as well. And I can tell you they love, they love Calvin and Hobbes, but they're still searching for that sense of you know, national character. Um, for a while, the Hong Kong scene was very strong. Uh, India is, keep an eye on India. I'm not sure exactly how it's going to go. The native Indian comics were kind of unique in the world, but I think that we could see, you know, sort of a Bollywood of comics maybe in the next 20, but I, I'm not sure exactly what shape that one's going to take. So, yeah, I don't know. It's, I, think, I think most of the world, other than the three major centers, which are, which are Japan, the Franco-Belgian tradition in, that, that covers Europe, and the Western tradition out of North America. Apart from that, I think a lot of it, there's a lot more potential uh, than active. I think that it's, it's like there's this, there's this underground energy that may be erupting in the next 20 years, but I'm not sure what shape it's going to take. Well, every time I read Understanding Comics discussion of speed and motion lines, I, I start <laughs> looking at Chinese minha and the incredibly oh. elaborate structures around movement that's, that's included in that tradition, mm. which does start to look like a language quite apart from Japanese manga. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I, oh, and also, probably I should have said right up, up front that there are people who are, have looked at this much more closely than I, especially a fellow named John Lent, who's been traveling Asia in particular for many years and documenting the local cartooning scenes therein. You may want to look up his work. 
Yeah, we do we have down here. Yeah, um, yeah Scott, um, this is more really a, a thought experiment on the on the pacing thing. So um, if you take the idea that we in serialized storytelling we're getting incredible character development that's slow over a period of time. And that if you're looking at HBO or the all the stuff that's done in TV where we're spending time with characters. Um, and that's something actually people want today um, uh, more than ever. Is the thought process then goes for comics? Is there a way that we can deal with the pacing? Um, let's call it. You know, you're talking about the gaps, and how could we spend time with the character uh, episodically, and allow us to really spend time with them, uh, which would then allow me want to see the next episode or the next bit of the graphic novel. Um, I'm not. So I'm talking about character development and pacing and slowness and building with the character over time. The gap thing feels um, like hit a light bulb in my head when you said that. Well, you know, this may be a slightly boring answer to the question because it's a good question, but I think that, that, that ultimately it's kind of predictable how best to create that same uh, sense of, you know, extended characterization is just, just better stories, better writing, and better human theater, this is something my editor and I on the graphic novel that I just finished have talked about a lot, is that we think that, that, that the acting and you know, facial expression, all of it, facial expressions, body language, the pacing of conversations, the pauses in conversations, and just the internal life of characters, I think too many, uh, too many comics are just a bit primitive on that score. We have a lot of work to do just to get it up to the level of even a, you know, a decent rom-com. I mean, we're just not we're just not there in a lot of cases. I think that we've made great strides in terms of you know interesting compositions, interesting stylistic ideas, uh, ideas about the form, ideas you know about the, the content within the form. But just the simple business of constructing human beings on the page, I don't know. We got to work on it. Um, also, I I uh, would like to see stories of greater length. Um, I think that the, the traditional comic magazine is just too short. It's definitely too short for what people pay for the damn things, which is one of the reasons that people try to cram so many words into the word balloons. Uh, I think it's very important. This is something that the all-ages authors understand. People like Raina Telgemeier know this, that each panel should represent an emotional state. And we often try to cram three or four uh, emotions into a given panel. If you look at what's going on in the word balloon, it's often like three or four different emotional states. And so what do you have? You have a picture of a person going, ah, uh, like that because, well, he can't look happy because he's only happy for this part of the balloon and he can't look sad, but, you know, like, and he can't look scared, but it's like each of those should be their own panel. We need to start breaking it up and do, do what manga did and have, you know, if you're going to have a 20-page chunk, it should come out once a week. Maybe we should just draw faster. I don't know. <laughs> because if the thing's on an iPad, really, I mean, you know, what's to stop you? Why can't it be? Says the man who took five years. Says the man who took five years to do his graphic novel. Yeah, but it's 500 pages. <laughs> Out February 3rd. There's, there's your marketing. And what's the title? Uh, it's called The Sculptor. Thanks. I honestly would have forgotten to tell them that. <laughs> <laughs> the worst okay, down, marketer ever. Okay, down here. <laughs> Hi. Um, so before I ask a question, uh, if, my, if I can um, give a 20 second like, shameless plug, I flow from Silicon Valley. I'm a founder CEO of a, of a startup called Tapastic.com. Uh, which is building an open platform for webcomic creators. We have about 3,000 people publishing with us. Um, so feel free to come check us out. You know, that was my 30 seconds of shameless plug. <laughs> but um, so my question is about the business side of the comics, so especially online comics, because now sort of like the um, accepted mode of monetization, the hated, ter hated term, is you sort of like share your content for free as much as you want, you know, try to build, your, build audience, then you try to sell other stuff like T-shirts or merchandising. Yeah. But if you look at the other, all the you know, pretty much all the other medium like games or movies, you know, you pay for the movie content itself. Mm -hmm. Like you buy the games, and then sometimes you buy the virtual items within the games. But then you don't necessarily buy T-shirts about the game as a way to support and pay for the content. 
Mm -hmm. um, do you have a t any take on that? Um, like, do you think the future monetization of comics can happen within the comic as an industry, or is it going to be continuing to be like monetizing off of all the other stuff, like secondary, you know, production, like you know, m making movies or videos or games out of the IP, or like merchandising, et cetera, et cetera? Well, I, I don't have a very good track record as a futurist when it comes to economics, so <laughs> take it with a grain of salt. Um, but uh, you know, I, I don't know. The the uh, it's not just now about about selling tchotchkes and you know side items, because uh, we really have to acknowledge that with Kickstarter and to a lesser degree things like Patreon. Um, uh, the the donation economy. There's probably a word for this. The blank economy. What word do we usually use to describe it? Say again. Crowd. Well, of course, crowdfunding. Uh, crowd. You know, the crowdfunding economy is significant enough now that we've got to take that into account when we look at this phenomenon. Uh, it's very significant. I did. I I preferred the notion of direct funding of content the idea of discrete amounts of content for very small amounts of money, um, but wasn't able to pull it off. And so we have the economy that we have. And I don't think, I don't see that turning around anytime soon. Um, but I don't know. I'm not sure. You know what? I just, I just spent five years doing a graphic novel for print. So I, I removed myself so far from that, just figuring, you know what? Let's just set, let this one sort it out. And I just, I came out blinking in the sun like, like uh, Rip Van Winkle. And the truth is, we haven't completely sorted it out yet. It's still in flux, and I don't know. I don't know how it's going to go. Okay, we have a question over here. Hi, thanks for coming. First of all, I, I really enjoyed your talk. Thank um, you. I work in video games, and it's a medium that uh, I'd say, much like comics, suffers from, uh, you know, a certain public perception that's not favorable, right? When you think of literature, you think of Kafka and Dickens and film, you think of Spielberg and Hitchcock and all those, uh, you know, those great masters. But when you think about, uh, when you think about comics and video games, you know, you think of, you know, superheroes and, uh, and shooting guns. Uh, how do you change that? How do you change that public perception, you'd say? There are many ways to change the public perception of an art form, but none of them are, will ever be as powerful as just making better stuff. You know, comics, comics is partially responsible. The, the people who create comics were partially responsible in the 20th century for the low opinion people had of comics. There were a lot of bad comics. Um, also, you mentioned film and literature. I mean, there's also Fifty Shades of Grey and Transformers, let's not forget. Uh, but, um, but people have accepted the proposition, not that literature or the cinematic arts are, in an, uh, are inevitably of a higher quality. They've simply accepted the proposition that both of those spheres are capable of higher forms of expression, of, of something of more literate to have, something that may be a more meaningful document of its time. We accept as a given that, that these vessels are capable of accommodating that, that ambition. That's all we ask of comics. We don't want to make people feel as if they have to capitulate and say, wow, I guess The Incredible Hulk really is uh, a masterpiece. Uh, it might be. I haven't, I haven't actually read The Incredible Hulk this year. Maybe it's really good. But um, that's, not, that's not what it's about. It's just, it's just potential. And... You know, it, you just, there just, maybe there just needs to be a few games even better. I mean, there have been some great games, and there's no question that, that, the, uh, that the form of expression that, that is making great games, there's no question that it's capable of tremendous things. But that was true of comics, too. And in a lot of ways, we just, we needed Mouse, and then we needed Jimmy Corrigan, and then we needed a few more of those. It's just like, okay, well, got a Pulitzer Prize, got this guy, okay, we're getting there, but we need a few more. Could we make that bookshelf a little thicker? And then we finally get to the point where it's just like, okay, thank God, there are finally enough comics that you can build a raft and, and sail the English Channel on them. There, there's enough <laughs> that, that you cannot, you can't deny that it's possible 
to make great things here. And so I think we need to counteract the prejudice against games, uh, certainly, but, but mostly I think gamers just have to keep working around the clock trying to make truly great stuff. And sometimes that means maybe ignoring the market. You know, things like the indie game jam or stuff, you know, like that, that I identify with. I think of it as sort of being like my, you know, the 24-hour comic type aesthetic, the idea of like speed exercise, doing really weird stuff outside of the, of the, the traditional industry. Maybe that's, that's a place for that kind of expression. I don't know. But, um, yeah, again, this sleep deprivation, I can tell this. This, this, this answer is not going to get any more cogent. It's only going <laughs> to slide down, get weirder and weirder and longer and longer. So time to move on. OK, so Jeff, you've got someone over there? OK, you're there. Um, so a lot of people are getting into uh, like North American superhero comics by seeing like movies like The Avengers first yeah. in other media. And then they'll get into those. And then they'll start reading other things entirely. And sometimes. Sometimes, yeah, yeah potentially yeah. branching out into other stuff. <laughs> A lot of people get into web comics because they'll be linked on some other website that like collects entertainment, like BuzzFeed, for example, or something like that. Yeah. Um, this is asking for kind of a long shot guess, but where do you think the entry point for people is going to be for when stuff like that starts happening, uh. like the, <laughs> like really weird, like more experimental type stuff? Well, I don't know. Of course, you know, like when you. When you propose a different form, then you're also asking people to enter into the content through a different window, and then the window becomes more conspicuous for that. Every new uh, construction is a challenge. And by its nature, it's probably going to have a smaller audience up front. Um, but that's, that's the price formalists pay. I mean, if you're going to do some like really weird, you know, I ju you know, some of you may have seen the documentary, Jodorowsky's uh, Dune, you know, <laughs> like this this insane movie that probably would have been 12 hours long and cost a billion dollars in 1978 or whatever. <laughs> it, just, it was never going to get made. But uh, but the great gift, if it had been made, would have been that it just like was this explosion of ideas. But those ideas eventually would be metabolized into, into work that was sort of content first. This is form first. Formalists understand. They're always going to have smaller audiences. Um, you know, every once in a while, they'll do something that, that, you know, like can be a breakout hit. Yeah, that can happen. But usually because they're kind of burying their toys a little. Um, I'm getting good early reactions to this graphic novel that comes out in February, but, and I'm a formalist, but I can tell you right now I'm impersonating my opposite number. You know, the reason, the reason it's getting good reactions from the few people who've seen it is because I just took all my toys, all my inventions, all my crazy gadgets, and I just buried them in the sand, and I just told a story beginning to end. Partially because that's actually kind of one of the secret aspirations of all formalists, is to reinvent themselves so you can't tell they're formalists. And that's a weird thing. But <laughs> um, yeah, you know what? This, this answer is also just going to get weirder as I go. OK, so we've got a question over there. We'll okay. keep them coming, oh. Scott. <laughs> yeah, no, go for it. About print comics and web comics, um, people approach print different than, differently than they would approach web comics. Like, yeah. I will spend the 20 minutes to drive to a bookstore and buy a book, as opposed to like, if my computer lags for two minutes while I'm trying to buy a web comic, I'm already like irritated and bored. <laughs> so like, how do you think this different approach to digital media versus print media affects how people read the digital media and print media? Well, of course, the one of one of the great uh, gifts of of this era. And, and the existence of that non-tangible alternative we, we think of as, as, you know, as the internet, as the web, is that we've, it's all of a sudden books became a physical thing again. We became aware of them as physical objects. And, uh, and if anything, we're accentuating that quality in books. And some of our best artists are creating art objects that have more physical presence and more physical beauty than ever before. Has anyone seen uh, Craig Thompson's Habibi and just the way that thing was 
packaged or the work of Chris Ware and his, his giant box set mad masterpiece building stories. Uh, you know, uh, that's, that's one of the wonderful things that's happening that's pulling print and web actually further apart. Now, for younger creators, they walk between the dimensions. They're conversant with both. They don't even see the fences and the signposts and the border crossings. They just, uh, you know, here it is on my Tumblr, here it is at the small press show, printed it up, here's a, here's a photograph I've took of my mini comic, and, you know, here's each spread, and I'm putting that back online, and they don't even know. They just, they just pass back and forth. But, but print is just, it's physical again. And when I started out, it wasn't, and I think that's wonderful. I like that. But yeah, I don't know. I, I believe you should de you should design for the device, and I hate repurposing. I hate the idea that once we've created it for one venue, that we should be able to wave a magic wand and make it appear in the other. I think it's just bad business, actually. I think it's I think it's short sighted because we could be creating two markets. We could be creating a market for, for things that were designed to be read on an iPad and things that were designed to be brought home as a book. And people could enjoy both and we could, we, the, the comics could grow. But instead we're trying to cannibalize it. We're just, we're just this, this horrible short-sighted beast eating its own tail and creating something that doesn't really work in either form where we stop ourselves from doing two-page spreads in the books because they won't work in digital. And then we, we have digital, this, this castrated digital version, because all we're doing is just adapting the print thing. It's designed for the device. I know that there's, there's a very noble uh, trend towards uh, you know, responsive design and sort of, in many ways, it's just the, the latest iteration of ideas that go all the way back to logical tags and, you know, like, <coughs> SHTML, what was it? The early alternatives where, where, where it's about, you know, the content or yeah, even CSS where it's about separating the presentation from the content and all that sort of thing. Um, these are, I understand that. I understand that idea that content can reflow in a variety of devices, reflow in a, a variety of contexts. That's great. But in comics, the shape of the content is too inextricably linked to the identity of that, of that work, of that form. The shape comics takes matters. And, and a, a Chris Ware page this big with a hundred little panels going in all these different directions, if you're only going to show a tiny piece of that thing at a time, you're doing violence to the work. You know, the shape of the presentation matters. And so the idea of reflowing, it's problematic where comics are concerned, as noble as that, as that idea is. Ivy's looking at me like, I must, did that answer make any sense at all? Was I rambling? You were rambling. Or are you just sleepy? I was really rambling there. You're rambling, yeah. Yeah. But you ramble in interesting directions, and we, and we forgive you. So, uh, so uh, we're going to have one more question over here. Uh, Hi. There. Hi, Scott. Uh, it's very interesting that you mentioned uh, more female uh, uh, comic artist mm -hmm. is happening because um, a lot of female, more female watch, read comic when they are younger. Mm -hmm. And as a, uh, I, I understand this is because of the circle of the audience and the creators. And uh, however, more female uh, comic artists, that means a lot more comic that being created will be more like a girly. Like maybe we fell in love with common because of the Superman, but mm -hmm. then when we create common, we may not continue and do the uh, Superman. We may do something like more girly. Yeah. And then um, like, like you said, audience and the creator's circle, it may affect the future audience and affect what will, like the balance between the old, uh, the, the male, common artists and female artists in the future. So what do you think about this? Would it affect anything in the future? Well, there are two sides to this. One is that, that a number of comics are now being created that, that don't really exist in the traditional boys club superhero mold at all. Um, you know, the comics just about relationships or, um, you know, high school romance or, or, or um, uh, you know, supernatural stories. 
um, or you know, pirates, or just like any number of things that are being read maybe by more women than, than men. Um, and you know, the all ages material uh, is often not superheroes at all. On the other hand, there's also a lot of rumblings just in the last couple of years amongst women who really enjoy superhero comics and notice that the stuff that they would enjoy the most in that realm is not often created. And they're, they're a significant part of the audience for superhero comics, and they just, they're not getting the comics they want, and they're not getting enough women writing comics. Um, and I get the feeling, I don't know, just, I just, in my gut, I think that if more women were making really cool, girl-friendly superhero comics, I would probably be reading those yeah. more than the guys' superhero comics. Uh, I don't know why, it's just like, I've always kind of liked that stuff more. Um, then, then the super testosterone thing where all the guys on the covers are going Arr! like that. It's like, why are they, why do they look like they're constipated all the time? <laughs> I don't, that stuff, the humorless testosterone clog stuff to me was just never as interesting. And I've kind of fallen off superheroes, but you know, something like Hawkeye comes along and, and you know, like that, that to me is more about relationship. It's done by a couple of guys, but, but you know, like that's. It's like, wow, I don't know. I could, I could go for more comics like that. We just got Ms. Marvel. I'm going to give that a try. Um, I don't know. Just to, we got to talk to Gail Simone about that in, uh, in England where we saw her. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Another, another sort women. of clipped arbitrary answer. There are more women making superhero comics now than I think there have ever been before. Yeah, so it is improving. But after, but there have been some battles about this, and there have been some unfortunate statements by guys in the superhero industry uh, that 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 you know ruffled a few feathers. So. And then you must like Amanda Connor. Yo, know, wait. What about Amanda Connor? You must like her then, because she has great comics, and she's done um, all the, the pro and all that. Yeah, she's been around for a while. But I got to admit, I just haven't been reading a lot of superheroes. Period. Mm -hmm. So I had I was beginning to get back into it a bit when I was editing Best American Comics, but it was kind of a rear guard action. Scott needed educating, <laughs> and Scott still needs a lot of educating where superhero comics are concerned. Okay, we've got one more hand down there, and then I need to cut you off because we uh, want to move to the second panel. So. I work in the video game industry um, for some time, for like 19 years. And um, actually, we have a very creative game coming out, Fantasia. So that's going to be something. But my question really is, um, what can, can you do a little riff on the, the lure of the superhero? What is that archetype all about? I mean, yeah. I get it from a lot of different directions, but I'm really curious as what you might have to say. Oh, sadly, I may not be the right person to answer that question um, because some people have done some, you know, good work on that on that score. But uh, you know, I'm afraid that many of my observations would be kind of the obvious ones. Uh, you know, certainly we're attracted to uh, you know these these power fantasies because we're as a, as a species, I think nearly all of us are in a constant state of of uh, dissatisfaction with our own relative powerlessness. Um, I certainly, I got it as a kid. I was into superheroes as a kid. Uh, my friend Kurt Busiek got me into them back in middle school. And I read that stuff at the age of 14. But I was already, by the time I got to 16, I was already, you know, this art form has potential, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> you know, like, and I was discovering the European stuff. And I was kind of gone because I was a nerd, because my dad was an engineer. And, you know, I was into nerdy things. And I had to take this kind of formalist view of it. So the superhero lure, it only lasted a few years, and then I was, I was off reading Raw, and you know, that was it. I was gone. Uh, but, um, but man, you know, like when I think of great superhero comics, I think of like Dr. Slump or, or uh, Scott Pilgrim, you know? Like why can't there be more superhero stuff like Scott Pilgrim? You know, that's, that, like who doesn't love that? And that, that book, so like gangbusters, you know, how is it that Marvel and DC haven't metabolized stuff like that? Um, 
that there's so many different ways that power fantasies can be you know can be brought into the mix so many different kinds of stories that can have power fantasies at the core that isn't just about angry constipated people growling at each other and and you know like having long expositional conversations and giant overloaded word balloons <laughs> you know standing in front of you know women crucified upside down in refrigerators or whatever just <laughs> awful things or I don't oh I just they're just they should be fun I mean they don't have to be fun like you know like oh it should all be good fun family fun it's like no 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 I mean there 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 can be all kinds of different kinds of fun they, they they don't have to be you know harmless and 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 castrated like like in the in the early 60s but um but no i just i just there's so much you can do with the idea of power power is interesting empowerment and you know like the metamorphosis of from weak to strong from from uh you know seeing one's potential just explode and kaleidoscopic ways there are a lot of ways to do that and i feel like we've only just begun to to use them just unfortunately right now the movies are doing it a little better the movies are good ventures was good <laughs> iron man was good dark knight was good you know they're just good ones i don't know we can't let movies be better than us <laughs> and anything. Okay, sorry. I'm really tired. I really didn't realize. Did any of that make any sense? Are we okay? We're, we're doing Did I right. like, okay, all right. Cause I was so with that, let's thank, thank Scott right. for coming. Thanks.